Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Wednesday, March 8, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Today is International Women's Day as the UN Women calls for harnessing the digital age for gender equality. The basic safety gear in the organization, many operations, was just designed for men. We need the right policies on career development, on promotion of gender diversity in job shortlists. There is progress in finance and banking in Rwanda, but more work is needed to create complete parity. A call for Nigerian women to compete for their country's top four political positions. UNHCR seeks support for Somalis fleeing Las Ano fighting into Ethiopia. Nigeria Supreme Court is to decide today whether the opposition will proceed with their challenge of the February 25 election results. The Independent National Electoral Commission filed a motion wanting the Court of Appeal in Nigeria to vary the earlier ruling to allow the party and the people to have access to all the electoral material. And is Russia quoting Malawi support on Ukraine? Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. More than 50% of women across the world have no access to the Internet compared to their male counterparts. This, according to the United Nations, which says most women are underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics careers. And as the global community marks International Women's Day today, Wednesday, the UN says the digital divide has become the new face of gender inequality. Maureen Ojiambo reports. According to the United Nations Population Fund, 39% of women have experienced sexual violence, threats, and body shaming online. UN Women Executive Director Sima Sami Bahoz says as much as the digital revolution presents opportunities for women and girls, it has also given rise to new challenges intensifying gender inequalities. A new kind of poverty now confronts the world, one that excludes women and girls in devastating ways, that of digital poverty. The digital divide has become the new face of gender inequality. The UN says women's rights have been violated and it may take a long time to break the gap in gender inequality. Miriam Golo is a chemical scientist and now the strategy and business development director at Bamburi Cement Company in Kenya. Ngolo has beaten all odds to become the first ever woman plant manager of a cement plant in Africa an industry that is dominated by men. For example, the basic safety gear in the organization, many operations, was just designed for men, meaning that we had to fit in a male-designed overall and a male-designed safety boot. We need the right policies on career development, on promotion of gender diversity in job shortlists. Golo says there were only two women in the company when she joined more than 20 years ago, though the number has now increased. She encourages women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics never to give up. I'm so happy to look back and see that our organization now has more than 30 percent women in the operations and uh, it's an achievement. It shows that um, embracing diversity and uh, equality is possible and uh, women can deliver results just as any other person. According to the UN Women Director, analysis of artificial intelligence systems across industries found that nearly half of the industries demonstrate gender bias. The status of women is under siege. Aspects of technology, such as social media, have roles in sharing vital information and rallying support, and also in causing further harm through spreading disinformation and fostering violent misogyny. It is critical that governments and private companies work together to foster technology as an enabler and accelerator of progress. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says global progress on women's rights is fading and that the goal of gender equality will take another three centuries to be achieved. Progress, won over decades, is vanishing before our eyes. In many places, women's sexual and reproductive rights are being rolled back. In some countries, girls go to school, risk kidnapping and assault. In others, police prey on vulnerable women 
they have sworn to protect. Gender equality is growing more distant. With this year's theme being Digital Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality, today's International Women's Day is a call to celebrate and recognize the contributions of women and girls who are advancing digital technology and building gender-responsive innovations. Its organizers say it's also a reminder that innovation and technology are major drivers of change that can break negative trends and reach those who are most likely to be left behind. Reporting for VOS Daybreak Africa, I am Maureen Ujimbo in Sacramento, California. The CEO of NCBA Bank in Rwanda says while there has been progress in terms of growth opportunities for women in finance, more is needed to create parity. Lina Higiro is also founder of Women in Finance Rwanda. She tells me the organization was started to create a platform for women to network and support development programs, gender parity, and leadership opportunities. Women in Finance um, was inspired by one uh, mere fact that we are about 16,000 women in the sector, and this includes insurance and microfinance, and we have nowhere we connect at all, no platform to connect, and no platform to develop thought lead, to elevate each other, to celebrate each other, to challenge policy. And that really was the starting point. So Rwanda has made uh, gains, I would say, in terms of gender equity, especially in politics. What do you think is the level of women representation in the area of finance and banking, to be specific? Currently, um, we are about 46% men and 54% women in the sector. This is the first year that we're seeing more women in the sector. That's the need to have effective collaboration platforms like Women in Finance. In terms of uh, parity, there is where we have quite a bit of work. Um, On the board level and on the chief executive level, we've seen quite a bit of uh, improvement. Um, However, when you go from the entry-level positions, between the entry-level to the C-suite, there is such a huge gap. In fact, there are more exits of women than there are women staying or women staying in the same roles for extended periods of time compared to their male counterparts. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of growth opportunities. Let me say that growing up in my native Liberia, my mother, like most women in Africa, was the manager of the household. How do you think modern banking can help African women better carry on their responsibilities? You know, I was listening to a TED Talk just a a few hours ago, and the title was The Future of Finances is a Woman. And um, I was very curious about that. And what really the speaker was saying is that women tend to invest 90% of whatever they earn, either in their families, in their well-being, or in their wider communities. As such, like your mother, and my mother was a businesswoman and we grew up in Kenya, uh, banks need to really think through how to advise women on what to invest and make banking simplified, investing simplified. We have some amazing services in the East African part of um, Africa where you can do a lot on your phone. And in Rwanda, with the institution I'm working with, NCBA, we see that many women enjoy using mobile platforms to save. It's very confidential and they can invest and uh, even start their own businesses using savings just on the mobile platform. So I think what institutions need to look at is what do women need um, from their financial institutions? They actually need advice. They need a, a sense of safety and a sense of direction. Lina, thank you so much again. It's a pleasure speaking with you. You're welcome. Lina Higiro is the CEO of NCBA Bank Rwanda and the founder of Women in Finance Rwanda. She was speaking with us from the Rwandan capital, Kigali. Only one woman has ever occupied any of the top four positions in Nigeria's government since independence in 1960. Women hold just 5% of the legislative seats in Nigeria, one of the lowest representation rates globally. As the world celebrates International Women's Day today, our reporter in Abuja looks at the low rate of female participation in Nigerian politics. Nigeria has never elected a female president, vice president, or even governor. Only a few women have served as deputy governor. In the 2023 elections, 
women are running for only 10% of state assembly seats, 9% of the National Assembly, 8% of the Senate, and 6% of all governorships. Hajia Ureti Kingibe won a senatorial seat representing Abuja in last month's presidential and national assembly election. She spoke to VOA about having a female president in Nigeria. It would be a dream come true, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. We have to get a transparent electoral process. Right now, the credibility and the transparency of the whole process is in great question. It's always the same thing. We prepare for these elections for four years, and at the end of it, nothing works. Hajia Kingibe, a Labour Party member, says corruption and the high cost of campaigns hinder women candidates. The biggest problem Nigeria has is it's generally corrupt. There's always there's a lot of challenges, violence, so many things, money, none of which I have. I have the people, but I'm not a thief. I haven't stolen any money. I haven't done any corrupt things. I don't intend to do any. So with all that amount of money flying around, there were so many people available to be bought. Africa's most populous nation has many women in leadership positions in the private sector and on the international stage. But when it comes to elected positions, they are underrepresented and often marginalized. Since 2006, there has been a plan to mandate that 35% of all elective offices be filled by women, and a federal high court in Abuja has ordered the government to comply with the plan. However, last year, 208 out of 290 lawmakers in the National Assembly voted against legislation to enact the plan. One issue for women is the fees that political parties charge for candidate nomination forms. The forms can cost thousands of dollars, pricing out many women and younger candidates. Barrister Juliet Ikanyere, who ran unsuccessfully for parliament last month, says women need to amplify their voices in the male world of politics. Some of this constitution of this party already accommodates women to come in, but we need the implementation of these policies. And only when the men adjust their mindset and give more room to women to contest and win, not just to buy forms freely and then at the end of the day, to change them with other men. Enede is a gender and media strategist and was a candidate in the 2019 elections. She says women must demand more from the political system. We as women group we have not done enough, we have not shown enough displeasure that we are not happy about a system that particularly rejects women for no reason. Ede, who says the statistics of women in the 2023 elections were the worst in history, is calling on the government and stakeholders to create an enabling environment to encourage more women to vie for elective positions. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Wednesday, March 8. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. A three-member panel of the Nigerian Court of Appeal is expected to rule today Wednesday on a petition by the country's Independent National Electoral Commission. The commission wants the court to change its previous ruling, allowing the opposition to inspect materials used to conduct the February 25 presidential election. The opposition People's Democratic Party, PDP, of Atiku Abubakar and the Labour Party of Peter Obi say they want to inspect the materials to form their decision whether to challenge the election results. The Elections Commission, also known as INEC, argues that sharing the information would violate the right to voter secrecy. Meanwhile, the West African Civil Society Forum Wednesday became the latest independent observer to say that the February 25 vote was initially free and fair until the counting and uploading to the INEC bimodal voter accreditation system. Sam Mike Ozikomi is one of the lawyers for Atiku Abubakar and Peter Obi. He explains to me what is expected to happen in court today. INEC, the Independent National Electoral Commission, five emotion wanting the presidential tribunal, which is the Court of Appeal in Nigeria, to vary the earlier ruling, even in favor 
or particular people's democratic party to allow the party and the people to have access to all the electoral material, including INEX, what we call IRS, including the papers, the primordial verification equipment, including the portal and everything that we needed to have access, and also have all the documents can and certified that our motion was granted by the Court of Appeal sitting as the presidential electoral panel, only for INEC to file a motion, an application, that they wanted that order very on the ground that they did not want voters to be exposed. So we have responded to that, and we have opposed that application on the ground that the Electoral Act only provided for secrecy of voters during voting, and that after voting, there is no longer any secrecy because they are not going to carry out any voting again on that presidential election. And that allowing the court to vary its earlier order means that INEC will tamper with the results of the election. And we didn't want that. So we are going to oppose that motion tomorrow. What are your expectations? Do you think uh, you will succeed? We cannot say what the expectations are. We are loyal. We carry out our argument. We allow the court to decide in its wisdom. So the PDP and the Labour Party have uh, gone to court to challenge the results. That APC and Ahmed Bola, Tinubu did not win. Why do these two parties believe that uh, Tinubu when did not win? Starts, when the case starts, you will know. The matter is already before the court. I cannot be discussing a court matter which has not yet come up. Thank you so much again, Professor. It's, it's a pleasure speaking with you. My pleasure. That was Sam Mike Ozikomi, one of the lawyers for Atiku Abubakar and Peter Obi. He was speaking with us from the Nigerian capital, Abuja. The United Nations Refugee Agency is calling for urgent support to help tens of thousands of Somalis who fled fighting in a disputed border town in Somalia's breakaway region of Somaliland. Maya Msika reports from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. The refugee agency is seeking urgent support for an estimated 100,000 Somalis who have fled to Ethiopia's Somali region. The Somalis were displaced by fighting in the town of Las Anod, the center of a conflict between the breakaway Somaliland region and locals who want to be governed by Somalia. The support is necessary to reduce the risk of conflict between host communities in Ethiopia's drought-affected Somali region, said Mamadou Dianbolde, the agency's representative in Ethiopia. If we do not support the populations who are hosting and who are doing their part, um, you know, we can do as much as possible, but, you know, we cannot reduce that risk. The communities affected by drought in Ethiopia were the first responders in welcoming the refugees, says Tasfahun Gobazi, Director General of Refugees and Returnees Service in Ethiopia. He says they are getting help from the UN World Food Programme. Uh, so far we have been uh, able to communicate with the WFP and they have generously uh, agreed to the idea that they will consider all host communities that are affected by the drought to be included in the, in the food distribution that would be uh, happening to the refugees. The UNHCR is also appealing for solutions to the problem in Las Anod so that people can return home. Somaliland Foreign Minister Essa Kayed says the government is open to dialogue, but not on the territorial integrity of Somaliland. We want to give chance to talks. We want to peace and stability to take place. Uh, we want to be inclusive and have uh, have uh, Las Anod and, and, and Seoul and Senegal regions in Somaliland as they were before. Uh, as you know, uh, members of uh, the clan who lives there are uh, in the Somaliland government. Garad Mukhtar Garad Ali one of the traditional leaders in the Seoul region says the most important prerequisite to dialogue is a ceasefire and that this is yet to be achieved. Each time Somaliland, Somaliland administration mentions the word ceasefire, it may mean something to the international community, but it has a different meaning to us, which is the preparation of a new attack to the city. So long Somaliland troops are present in and out or in and around the city, and can fire at us easily, it won't be possible to have a ceasefire successfully. The first asylum seekers arrived in Ethiopia on February 6. And while estimates by local authorities in Ethiopia put the figure at nearly 100,000, this number has yet to be substantiated. Maya Misaker for VOA News, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia.
Russia's ambassador to Moscow has said he hopes African leaders will call for an end to the international sanctions against Moscow at an upcoming Russia-Africa summit. Nikolai Krasinikov made the comment on Monday as Russia made a donation of 20,000 tons of fertilizers to Malawi. An analyst says Russia is likely trying to win diplomatic support for its war in Ukraine. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre, Malawi. The donation amounts to 3% of Malawi's annual national fertilizer requirement of 600,000 tons. Sam Gawale is Malawi's Minister of Agriculture. He said the fertilizer is a major boost for the country, which is dealing with shortages in its agriculture inputs program, which sells supplies like seeds and fertilizer to poor farmers at cheaper prices. The 20,000 metric tons that we are receiving today is going to help. 400,000 families, which we're estimating that 800,000 metric tons of maize will be harvested, either using the rain fed as well as irrigation. The donation is part of the UN brokered Black Sea Green Initiative designed to end the disruptions in Russian and Ukrainian food exports caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year. Nikolai Krasnikov is Russia's ambassador to Malawi. The Associated Press quoted him Monday, saying he hopes African leaders will help press to remove sanctions against Moscow at a July Russia-Africa summit. He said overall, Russia has given 260,000 tons of fertilizers to poor countries in Africa and other parts of the world. So what they have now is the delivery to Malawi. It is the uh, part of, of a bigger commitment of Russia being fulfilled by Oral Hemp, Oral Kali, the main Russian manufacturer of fertilizers and one of the world's leading producers and exporters of mineral fertilizers. Malawi and political analyst George Piri says the donation may be driven by Russia's desire to win more African support at the UN and against the sanctions that many Western countries placed on allies of President Vladimir Putin following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. In my view, it's possible that uh, Russia would want to mobilize some African countries to be on her side, and uh, Malawi could be one, uh, looking at uh, uh, how many African countries are voting against Russia. At the United Nations General Assembly last year, Malawi voted to censure Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, but more than 50 other African countries abstained from the vote. Russia's ambassador, Krasnikov, said Monday that President Putin has invited Malawian officials to attend the Russia-Africa summit slated for July in Moscow. We expect the delegation from Lilongwe to the summit, as well as we expect Malawian business community from all over the country to come to the economic forum. And I encourage all interested to approach the Russian embassy in Zimbabwe, where is my residence, uh, to come and to find all necessary requirements and details. Malawi Minister of Agriculture Kawali told reporters that Malawi has welcomed the Russian invitation. In August last year, Malawi President Lazarus Chakwera had a phone conversation with President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine and assured him of Malawi's support as Ukraine continued to defend itself from Russia's attack. Lamik Masina for VOA News, Blantyre.